Our third topic today uh, on the subject of Greek religion that you've been asking about is miasma pollution. Now, what is miasma, the Greek term? It's been defined, I'm going to read out Bremer's definition of miasma as an important consequence of overstepping or breaking existing cosmological, social and political boundaries, the result of which of that overstepping was the incurrence of pollution. Uh, pollution, he puts it, and purification, how you get out of being polluted, was an important way of maintaining religious and social norms and values in a time when the legal process was still underdeveloped. So there we have it in a nutshell that miasma is about maintaining boundaries. It's about marking out when those boundaries have been passed and then also prescribing a way through which you got back across to the right side of the boundary. Pollution and purification two sides of the same coin. Now that makes it sound fairly simple, but the problem is that anything to do with Greek religion is not simple. If you remember back to how I described the nature of Greek religion, its incoherence, its flexibility, its variety, that also applies not just to the kind of how you worship the gods, but it also applies to how you incurred pollution and how you got yourself purified. In fact, it comes to me as a shock to even work out how the ancient Greeks went about their daily life uh, without tripping over a boundary or some other and somehow incurring pollution. If you have a moment, I would really recommend you read Theophrastus, who is the fourth century philosopher, botanist, but also study of characters. And he wrote a, a text called The Characters, which offers a number of different stock type descriptions of people that you could see about the Greek city. And one of them is called The Superstitious Man. Uh, now this text is brilliant because it describes somebody who absolutely doesn't want to fall foul of a single way in which he could possibly get polluted. And as a result, he gets nothing done all day because he isn't able to move in any direction, really, uh, without incurring pollution and thus having to go off and do something to purify himself. Or he refrains from doing something just in case it will get him polluted. So what that text, that Theophrastus text, gives us is a clear sense that you could be too religious, in a way, in the ancient Greek world. You could be too afraid of incurring pollution to actually just go about getting something done. And that most Greeks were trying to tread a sort of sensible middle course where you avoided the major causes, perhaps, of miasma, of pollution, but that you didn't get hung up over um, the, the nitty-gritty of the, some of the smaller ways. So let's focus on those major ways. What were the major ways uh, that got you polluted? What were those major boundaries that the Greeks wanted to mark? Uh, and they were things that are marked in many, many ancient communities. A moment of childbirth, for instance, for the woman who gave birth was thought to be polluting, as was death. Um, equally, uh, sex could be a polluting moment. Uh, disrespecting a sanctuary. Murder was another one, major one, although very conveniently it was considered that when you went off to fight as a soldier in a battle and thus were killing lots of people, miasma just didn't apply. It was all above board and authenticated and accepted by the gods uh, that you would be killing in this particular environment and thus you wouldn't be incurring miasma. Uh, equally things like denying burial for someone who deserved burial would incur miasma. Go and have a look at Sophocles Antigone if you want to see more. Now if you didn't respect the rules of miasma and you incurred pollution, then there was a whole series of punishments that awaited you if you didn't go then through the correct course of purification. Um, and that could mean things like, uh, sometimes it was just a case of ritual washing, you had to sort of purify yourself. Um, sometimes you had to sacrifice an animal, so in a sense you had to sort of pay a fine to the god to get back in the god's good books for having been polluted. Sometimes you had to pay a, a financial fine, which could go to a religious institution, a sanctuary, or it could actually go to a civic institution, again, mixing the boundaries between the, the political world and the religious world. And sometimes you had to just be killed. Sometimes there was no way out of it. So for example, in Athens, if a murderer, right, if you were, uh, you'd been convicted of murder and thus you were polluted, end of story. If you entered a sacred spot, so you defiled a sanctuary by entering in your murdered state, you brought your pollution into a sanctuary and thus defiled the sacred space. It was the sworn duty of every citizen of Athens to immediately kill you. 
uh, and killing you in that instance meant, just like on the battlefield, the person who killed you didn't get polluted because they were enacting the will of the gods. So pollution and, and, and get, bringing pollution into spaces that it shouldn't be, particularly sanctuaries, was taken very, very seriously indeed. But then you have the problem of actually the rules, the, the rules around even major pollution, childbirth, death, sex, disrespecting sanctuaries, denying burial, those sorts of issues. The rules about exactly when you got polluted, how long you were polluted for, your ability to pass that pollution on to somebody else, and indeed how you purified yourself from that pollution varied across pretty much every sanctuary in every city in the Greek world. So just because you knew how things worked in Athens didn't mean you knew how things worked in Corinth, Sparta or Argos. Just because you knew what one sanctuary considered to be polluting in terms of, say, the number of days, the number of, uh, uh, the number of times or when during the day you had sex and as a result how long you were polluted for in respect for one sanctuary didn't mean that that held for the sanctuary just next door. So we have here a case where there would have been myriads of different rules and regulations regarding pollution that Greeks had to sort of pick their way around and make sure that they were aware of when they went to do particular kinds of religious acts. I'll give you one example here. We have a law of purification that dates from the fourth century that comes from Cyrene. Now Cyrene is down in modern day Libya and it was a Greek colony. And the fourth century law that survived for is an inscribed text is supposed Supposedly, the direct uh, kind of ish proclamation from the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, setting out the sacred laws by which the sanctuaries of Cyrene and the settlement of Cyrene should operate. And one of the things it talks about is when and how miasma pollution is incurred. And here's just some of the things that they say that specifically operate at Cyrene. Women who give birth pollute the house and anyone inside the house but they don't pollute anyone who's outside the house, irrespective of their relationship to the woman. Any person who is inside is polluted for three days, and after that, the pollution disappears, but does not pass the pollution on to anyone else that they meet. So they can go about their business, interact with everyone else without the danger of passing on pollution. So here we get a very detailed set of circumstances surrounding when childbirth happens, who is polluted, how long for, how long they have to wait before they're no longer polluted, and indeed the degree to which they can pass it on to the rest of society. This same text also talks about what happens during miscarriage. And it says this, it says, if the child at the time of miscarriage is distinguishable, then the woman is polluted as if somebody had died. But if the child is not distinguishable, then they are polluted as if from childbirth going down to the very specifics of the nature of the miscarriage, which then have radical implications for how you consider that person to be polluted, how long for, how, the long they, how easily they pass it on to others, what they must do to purify themselves. Now a final note to the difficulties and varieties and flexibilities of miasma pollution in the ancient Greek world is that there are some messages in the ancient sources about how this idea was rejected. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the places that this gets marked for is, is in Sparta. Now a later writer, Plutarch, writing about the life of Lycurgus, who was the famous lawgiver in Sparta, who set up the great retro, the Spartan constitution by which the Spartans lived in the archaic and classical periods, says this, Plutarch writes this, he says that one of the things Lycurgus did was to banish superstitious beliefs about death by lifting the prohibition about people being buried within the city limits, which normally was considered a big no-no because of the pollution, the miasma it incurred for the city itself. As a result, Plutarch writes, young Spartans grew up, became so familiar with the sites of burials that they were not upset by them, nor did they fear that death, uh, nor did they fear death or believe that it polluted them. Um, if they touched a dead body, dead body or walked by a graveyard. So there are some indications that there were, there were pushbacks, if you like, 
against the power and importance of miasma in certain, uh, certain places in the Greek world. And certain steps were taken in certain cases, it seems like here in Sparta, to try and make sure that people didn't get over affected um, by this idea so that they couldn't then grow up to engage fully with the realities of life um, and uh, the, the nature of their civic structure. A final note from me moves us to the sanctuary of Asclepius, of the healing god, uh, because I think here miasma plays a particularly tricky part. Right? One of the things you, you did, you went to a sanctuary of a healing god when you were unwell, right? uh, or perhaps if you had problems with childbirth, or if you were old and, and potentially on the edge of death. But childbirth and death, we know are two things that bring about pollution. And you can't, the worst thing you can do is pollute a sanctuary. So how did you, they get around this within a healing sanctuary for people who were about to give birth or perhaps on the verge of dying? And here I think we have a rather horrifically black comedy image in our minds. At the sanctuary of Asclepius at Epidavros, we have uh, a list of uh, amazing things that the god managed to do that was inscribed on the walls of the sanctuary as people came uh, to visit. And the very first one of those is about a woman called Cleo, who was pregnant for five years but couldn't get around to giving birth. Uh, and so she comes into the sanctuary, she sleeps the night in the abaton, the sacred place where the god was supposed to visit you and heal your problem. Uh, and the god does indeed visit Cleo and makes it possible for her to give birth, but she then has to hot foot it out of the sanctuary to actually give birth because she can't possibly do that within the sanctuary itself for fear of bringing pollution to the sanctuary. And the other is from the Asclepiae on, on the island of Delos, where this poor uh, chap who went there very, very ill indeed, uh, kind of hoping for a miraculous recovery, uh, wasn't given his wish from the gods. And as a result, they put him on a boat and they shipped him quickly off the island to die on the next door island. So again, not a very good outcome for this poor chap, but at, at the end of the day, you couldn't die within a sanctuary of Asclepius either uh, if the god decided not to heal you.